Hello. Uh, welcome, everybody. Um, on behalf of the IGC, the Grantham Institute in the Department of Economics, uh, so welcome to have um, Michael Greenstone, who is the uh, uh, Milton Friedman Professor of Economics uh, at the Department of Economics in uh, Chicago. And Michael's going to be talking about the global uh, energy and growth challenge. So this is an area where uh, there's a lot of active new research going on in the world. And Michael's going to make an attempt to sort of say, uh, what's that all add up to? It's an interesting area in part because if you think about mainstream economics, uh, energy and environment are just slowly pushing their way into mainstream economics. And it's very much the case that Michael is at the, the forefront of that uh, push into mainstream economics. So what we're going to do uh, today is to have um, uh, Michael present for about 45 minutes. And then we have a very distinguished discussant, uh, my former PhD supervisor, uh, Nicholas Stern, who will uh, offer some discussants comments at the end of those 45 minutes. So we have a lot of time for, for those of you who uh, um, want to ask questions. So one thing that I think I, I should just mention, I'm the director of the IGC, and one, one thing that we're really trying to sort of push out there is this idea that uh, we need to work with partners in uh, developing countries on actually affecting change. So what we try to do is sort of create a bridge between frontier research and policymakers in uh, developing countries, primarily in sub-Saharan Africa uh, and Asia. So what you'll get is a sense of that, that work, but also a broader picture of what's happening in the world. So what I'd hope you to do is, as we go through the lecture and through Nick's comments, if you can sort of pull in questions, prepare questions, and then we should hopefully have a good half an hour of discussion uh, at the end of the lecture when you can all ask uh, whatever questions have come to mind. So without further ado, Michael Greenstone. Okay, uh, thank you very much for the opportunity uh, to present here today, uh, Robin, Nick, and uh, my other colleagues at the LSE. So I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, the global energy and growth challenge. I've, uh, everyone loves lists, so I've come up with uh, seven facts that I think can help shape how you think about the problem. Uh, and then we'll talk a little bit about directions for policy uh, that I believe fall out of uh, those seven facts. And I'm sure we'll have a robust discussion around that. Okay. Uh -oh. Where am I pointing this? Okay. Yes. I have to turn it on. It, uh, <laughs> like a lot of things, it requires energy. Uh, okay. Excellent. So here's a here's a picture. If you can remember one thing from this talk. Uh, I think this picture uh, captures much of what's at the center uh, of the global energy challenge. Uh, and so if you look at this, it's one of my uh, favorite pictures. I had long wanted to be a photographer uh, and spent much of high school uh, trying to do that. Uh, I think I maybe peaked in my sophomore year, although I kept doing it for two more years. Uh, and this picture really captures so much. So it, this is in Beijing, uh, and you, anyone who's been to China will recognize that when you're in China these days, you can just feel the energy on the street. Uh, and you know, China is on the make, it's on the move. Uh, and that, pic that, is, that sense is captured uh, in this picture. Uh, and you can see the guys driving and the guys riding his bike. And what's also true, though, in that picture uh, is that you can see that it was just in the blink of an eye ago that the guy in the taxi cab was on the other side of the bar, uh, the, the gate. And the guy in the bike was probably on the other side of the far gate, and he was walking, and the guy in the car was probably riding a bike. Uh, and in the blink of another eye, you can see going forward that the guy in the bike, he's not going to be on that bike for very long. Uh, he's going to be in a car. Uh, and the folks walking, you can barely make out in the picture, they're going to be, uh, they're probably not going to be walking. They'll be driving or they'll be on a bicycle. Uh, and what powers that movement, that unprecedented improvement in living standards that happened in China uh, 
over the last 25 years, of course, is energy. Uh, and there's, there's been no change in improvement in living standards in recorded history that uh, resembles it. Now, so that's the first thing, is energy is at the center uh, of growth. You can't have it without the, uh, one without the other to a first approximation. Uh, but what's also true, and you can see it there, uh, for those of you who've been to China, you'll recognize it. This is actually the middle of the day. Uh, there's no sun. Uh, and that sun, where's the sun? The sun is there, uh, but it's hiding behind all the pollution. Uh, and that pollution is a direct output of the consumption of the form of consumption of energy that is causing that rapid uh, increase in living standards. Uh, and our friend here riding the bike, he's very aware of the pollution. Uh, he's got the mask on, he's got the goggles on. It's impinging on his well-being in uh, many respects. Uh, and so that's the second thing. How can you have this great improvement uh, in uh, living standards and energy consumption without running into the, all this pollution? Uh, and then the third thing is not actually visible, but you viscerally know it's there. Uh, and that pollution is being generated by fossil fuels, but so is CO2, and you can't see the CO2. But the CO2 is changing the climate. Uh, and so that's really what I think is at the center of the energy challenges. How do you have the increased energy consumption that is needed in many parts of the world to improve living standards without unnecessarily uh, imposing on people's health uh, and without changing the planet in disruptive ways uh, that we appear to be on a path to doing. So let's, with that in mind, and we'll come back to that picture at the end, let's talk about the seven facts uh, about energy and growth. I think, uh, so number one, uh, so a lot of, none of, I will confess that none of these facts uh, are super deep in and of themselves, but I think together they help pull together a picture that you, you can help you think about the broader issues. So the first is uh, energy is critical to growth. Uh, anyone who uses data for a living like I do knows that data disappoints you in a million different ways, uh, and half of them, you know, most of them unpredictable. Uh, and your hypotheses are always being proven wrong by data. This is, uh, this is like a bright shining moment for uh, data in the sense that uh, it's very rare that there's such a tight relationship, but here there's a very tight relationship. Uh, and that is on the x-axis we've got total energy consumption, on the y-axis there's uh, GDP per person. And what the line and the relatively narrow spread around the line are trying to tell you uh, is that it's, while there can be a little, at a given uh, le le level of energy consumption, there can be a little variation in GDP, uh, but not very much. Uh, and uh, by and large, it's not possible, uh, or it has not been possible to date, to have high living standards without lots of energy consumption. So that's number one. Uh, number two, let's call it energy access, uh, is a major problem around the planet. Uh, and there's these two graphs uh, kind of show it graphically. This is a percentage of the population with direct access to electricity. Uh, dark green uh, are, are places that where the entire population has it, and the lighter green are places uh, where fewer people do. Uh, another way to display this is the uh, per capita kilowatt hours, electricity consumption. Uh, you know, it looks a lot like you might think it would before you looked at it. Uh, there's places in the, on the planet that have very low levels, and there's places uh, with very high levels. And it might be easier to see all of this uh, in the following table. Uh, and so this is just a selective representation of uh, some of the countries uh, or, or, and parts of the world. And so you can see uh, there's really a kind of shocking heterogeneity uh, in energy consumption ar ar around the world. So the United States per capita electricity consumption is about 13,000 kilowatt hours per person. Uh, Germany is 7,000, uh, Russia is maybe 6,500, and then you get to China and India. Uh, now these are countries that have lots and lots of people, uh, you know, 1.4 billion in China and 1.3 billion in India, and the numbers are actually kind of jarring. Uh, in China it's just 3,300 kilowatt hours per person, uh, and in India it's, this is about 700, this is a couple of years old now, so maybe it's eight or 900 now. Uh, and for those of you who aren't conversant in kilowatt hours, we put the, I put the little chart there. Uh, so it takes 131 kilowatt hours to use a 60 watt bulb for six hours per day for a full year. So that's, think about that, this is a very low level in India. Uh, 
And as another point of reference, I put on there uh, the state of Bihar. It's got 100 million people in it. That is a big state. Uh, and per capita electricity consumption there is only about 120 kilowatt hours. The only point I'm making is uh, these guys are not going to stay like that for long. Uh, there's going to be tremendous demand, just as our guy riding the bike wants to get in the car. Uh, I think uh, this, this is going to be lots of demand from these two countries, but also many other countries around the world that have low levels of energy consumption. Okay, uh, and that is maybe best captured in this next fact, which is that today's developing countries are going to increase energy consumption. Here's projections from the OECD, uh, uh, and the world here is divided into OECD countries, or rich countries, and non-OECD countries. And you can see that uh, between 2010 and 2040, uh, the, non, the OECD countries energy consumption is projected to increase by maybe 10%. You could think of it as roughly flat, uh, whereas it's uh, projected to double uh, in the developing countries. And we're going to come back to this in a, in a couple minutes, but a key, uh, a key point here is that uh, not, not only is it going to double, but it will be about double what it is in the rich, today's rich countries uh, by 2040. Now that, that will be projected to go on and on. And so I'll just lay the seeds for what's coming. Uh, the, today's developing countries are really going to be the largest energy consumers in the uh, world as, as we move forward. All right. Now, uh, the next fact is uh, fossil fuels are inexpensive and abundant. Uh, and sometimes uh, I think everyone at some gut level knows that's true, but sometimes it's helpful uh, to look at the numbers. So this is in the United States. Uh, this is for, um, uh, in maybe 2011, I think I did, I did this analysis. Uh, and this is the cost of producing a kilowatt hour of electricity from several different sources. Uh, so for from an existing coal plant, it's about 3.2 cents per kilowatt hour. Uh, from a new coal plant, so that would be one that would have to comply with all the up-to-date U.S. regulations and uh, requirements for pollution control. It would be more expensive, maybe on the order of six cents, 6.2 cents a kilowatt hour. Um, a new natural gas plant could produce a kilowatt hour of electricity at about five and a half cents. And so those are the one. The, these are the fossil fuels that are circled in red. Uh, the clean energy or non-fossil fuels are not circled in red. And the point to draw from that, and these numbers are subject to change, and, uh, but the bottom line point is not really subject to change. Uh, it, or it, it might be in the future, but it, it isn't up now. A new nuclear plant would produce a kilowatt hour of electricity at about 9.4 cents. Uh, so that's, you could think of that as almost triple uh, what an existing coal plant does. Uh, wind in a favorable location with some backup to deal with intermittency would produce uh, kilowatt of electricity about nine cents, and it's about 12.2 cents uh, for solar PV. There's been a lot of progress in solar. This is probably that number is probably still a little high. It's probably a little high now, but the the first order comparison uh, remains. Fossil fuels are the cheapest form uh, of electricity, and I'm just going to again to plant the seed. I just want to remind you who's going to have the biggest increase in energy consumption. It's going to be the developed today's poor countries. Um, so not only is that true. And uh, not only, and I, you know, I don't want to gloss over it, there's been tremendous improvement in the costs, uh, bringing down the cost of renewables, but renewables are always going to have to beat fossil fuels to get in the money. Uh, and what has been true in North America, uh, and uh, I guess if I follow the British election correctly, is becoming true uh, in the UK, although I suspect a little bit more slowly than North America, is that there has uh, been tremendous innovation in uh, the reducing the cost of recovering fossil fuels. So this is a uh, graph or a uh, picture of uh, how fracking is done, and that's how it's uh, led to big accessing petroleum and natural gas that people previously thought was inaccessible. Uh, and you can see in the horizontal well case, that's the fracking case, uh, that it's, it's, it is a technological feat. They drill down two miles, make a right turn, 90 degrees, go straight, uh, and then they shoot on unknown, uh, unknown liquids uh, in, down there. They create fissures in the 
uh, into shale rock and then out pours uh, uh, natural gas and petroleum depending on uh, where it's located. Uh, this has proven to be a really reliable way to recover uh, fossil fuels. Uh, in fact, the old way, you know, oftentimes you would uh, drop a well and there would, you, it would end up being dry and there would be nothing there. They now refer to fracking as farming. It's so reliable. Uh, you will not hit a, uh, a dry well. You might not get that much out of it, but it, it is very reliable. Uh, it's also worth noting that this map illustrates that although it's primarily gone on in North America so far, and primarily in the United States at that, uh, there's shale formations all over the world. Um, and uh, my, if I, my UK geography is right, I think I see some red there. Uh, uh, and uh, to date, there really has not been much accessing of that. Uh, I think to leave it all there unperturbed uh, is, is effectively signing up for the viewpoint uh, that people are going to leave $100 bills buried in the ground unperturbed. My own view is that human history's, human's history of leaving $100 bills buried in the ground unperturbed is a very short one. Uh, it might be that we don't get them all, we don't uh, use all that, but I, I think there's a, a substantial chance. So how much is actually there uh, to be had? So if you added it all up, as I try to do in this table here, uh, there, what is potentially recoverable, technically recoverable shale oil resources is about 10 years worth of uh, current petroleum uh, global consumption. You could think of that as kind of having fallen out of the sky. It didn't exist. People knew it was there, but it wasn't accessible at, in an economic way as recently as maybe seven or eight years ago. Uh, and maybe 70 years of natural gas also fell out of the sky. Uh, and, you know, I don't want to go on too long about the fracking. The major point I want to make is the gas and oil companies and the, oil, the consulting companies in that industry are all working just as hard as the guys who are trying to bring down the cost of renewables. Uh, and if this is, uh, if renewables are really going to, or low carbon energy is really going to hold the day, it's going to have to beat these guys in, 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 the mar in the marketplace. And we'll come back to different ways to do that. So this is meant to be more illustrative than anything else, but I think we have to, as we contemplate the energy future and contemplate uh, how not to uh, make ourselves uh, lead shorter than necessary lives with high levels of air pollution and how not to lead to disruptive climate change, we're going to have to confront that there may well be, at least in the time span that matters for climate change, an infinite supply of fossil fuels. And that's what this picture uh, illustrates. Okay, so now I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, well, what, so uh, there's a lot of fossil fuels that are cheap, cheap uh, to produce electricity, but they also have other costs associated with them. And I, I'll talk a little bit about some research here that tries to illustrate that. Um, so I, I wrote a paper two years ago about the effects of air pollution on life expectancy. Uh, in China, it was using data from the 1990s. Uh, and I wondered, uh, well, is this relationship still true? And so I recently, along with some co-authors uh, got access to some data from the 2000s, uh, and we took another look at that. Uh, and the idea of this paper was to exploit kind of a natural experiment. Uh, and so that natural experiment took the form of China's Huai River uh, winter heating policy. Uh, this was established in the planning period between 1950 and 1980, uh, when there, China didn't have enough resources to provide winter heating uh, for everyone. Uh, so they came up with a pretty arbitrary rule. The Huai River, which bisects the country, I'll show you a map of that in a minute. They said everyone to the north of that can have free coal between November 15th and March 15th. The dates vary depending on how far north you are. Uh, and that was uh, to provide free winter heating. And in, to the south, uh, you're actually, for, in this period, were forbidden from having heating. Uh, and as a way to drive that home, I was at a university in Chengdu several years ago giving a lecture, which is south of the Huai River, but in the northern part of the south, and I'll show, that, show it to you on a map in a minute. Uh, and the, you know, the room, lecture hall, just like this, uh, had no heating, and it was in the middle of the winter, and the students were all wearing winter coats, and that, that's just the way it is. Uh, now, in recent years, as the market economy has taken hold, heating has started to show up in, uh, in, in the south. But this is the idea of the paper, is 
there's a very discreet change in policy right at the river's edge. Uh, and that discrete change involves the combustion or uh, use of lots and lots of coal. Uh, I'm going to show you that that greatly increased air pollution. And I'm going to ask, the point of the paper is to ask, what happened to life expectancies uh, as a consequence, uh, unintended consequence of this policy that was intended to benefit uh, people providing winter heat. So here's some examples. So uh, another uh, feature of this uh, system was that they didn't build some giant power station. They built a lot of really small, <coughs> inefficient boilers. Uh, here's to, to, to do the heating. Here's some examples. Uh, here's a map that has, uh, you can see the blue line. That's the Huai River. At some point, it kind of dies out, and it turns into a mountain range. But the key thing for the purpose of this paper is just to the north, everyone's getting free coal. That's still true. Uh, and to the south, at least for a long period, winter heating uh, was forbidden. Here's Chengdu, which I talked about a minute ago. Uh, and you can see that's in the northern part of the south and might very well have uh, cold winters. Um, so the first, and there's really boils down to two or three facts. Uh, the first fact uh, is well, what happened to PM10 concentration? So PM10 is a, uh, a form of a measure of particulate matter air pollution, which is a form of air pollution that's thought to have uh, the most pernicious health consequences. And what you can see is that it's 43 micrograms per cubic meter higher north uh, of the river, and that's a jump that occurs right at the river's edge. Uh, and for those of you who are unfamiliar with micrograms per cubic meter, which may be many of you, you should think of it as about a 50% increase in pollution uh, in the north uh, relative to the south. Uh, and all, all these, uh, so all, all, all these places here are the northern cities and all these are the southern ones. And the circles are proportional to the number of people who live uh, in that location. And uh, it's north and south is measured in degrees latitude. So now the, the, the next step, uh, and you know, the most important one is, well, what happened to life expectancies? Uh, and the somewhat uh, amazing, not in a good way, uh, is that uh, there is a kind of mirror image. Uh, while there was an increase in pollution, there appears to be a decrease in life expectancy. And it, it's about, in the 2000s, it looks like it's about four years. Uh, and, and maybe three and a half years. And uh, from that, uh, I conclude that, uh, or we concluded that air pollution uh, has, uh, that it's not just that air pollution north and south matter, but uh, you can learn about uh, the, uh, how, uh, the consequences of air pollution everywhere by uh, developing an estimate of the relationship between particulate matter and, and life expectancy. Um, it's also worth noting that this, the data that we are using from China has uh, cause of death information on it, and it's all driven by an increase in cardiorespiratory uh, causes of death, not by uh, other causes. So, and here's a picture of, uh, in, in India. Uh, you know, India actually now has places that are, have worse uh, air pollution than Beijing or than China, and so this problem is pervasive. It's not just a Chinese problem. Uh, and here's a map of particulate matter concentrations around the the world, and you can see though that the worst places tend to be in Asia, there, although uh, concentrations are high in parts of Africa and the Middle East uh, as well. And so, you know, if you took the numbers that we found in that paper in China, you would say that people living in the north of China are living in total maybe about two and a half billion years, life years less than people in the south due to that air pollution. Uh, you could do an analogous exercise for India and said, ask what happens if you bring all of India into compliance with India's own particulate matter standards, and you would uh, see a gain of about 2.1 uh, billion light years. Okay, so that's fossil fuels cause pollution and harm health. That seems to be uh, uh, come along with the use of fossil fuels. Uh, it's also true that fossil fuels cause climate change. Uh, and I think it's maybe worth just taking a little dive into that and what the consequences of that might be. Uh, and so what this is just, this map, uh, this picture of the planet is just showing uh, the change in temperature in 2013 relative to 1980. People, I think graphs like this are, are uh, pictures like this are familiar to many of you. Uh, one thing that's worth noting is you can see that the change in temperature isn't constant around the planet. Uh, it's higher in the northern parts. Uh, here's, if we follow the business as usual scenario, uh, 
so that is without coordinated action on uh, reducing greenhouse gas emissions. What could we expect would happen uh, to global mean temperatures? Uh, and it looks like by the end of the, according to this, by the end of the century, we might expect about a three degrees C increase, but there's a lot of variability around that. And you can see that the 95% confidence interval seems to cover maybe roughly two all the way up uh, to five degrees. Uh, one thing is, that's a very hard concept to relate to, uh, is global mean temperatures. At least I find it very hard to relate to. Uh, and so I also made this picture, which might be a little bit easier way uh, to relate to it. And this says uh, the number of days, and I'm choosing India uh, for, uh, on purpose here, but the number of days that the average Indian faces where the temperature is in each of these very small temperature bins, these are three degrees wide. So they range from less than 49 to greater than 97, and then three degrees uh, wide in between. And so you could see that the typical Indian faces uh, about uh, 60 days a year where the temperature is between 79 and 81 degrees uh, Fahrenheit. Uh, it's worth noting that that's the average temperature for that day. That's not the high, that's not the low, it's the mean of those two numbers. Uh, and that's, that's what they face today. What I'm now going to put up, uh, and I think it's a little bit easier to relate to than global mean temperatures changing, is what's the predicted distribution from a state-of-the-art uh, climate model. Uh, and it's really amazing. Uh, you see this enormous increase or piling up uh, on uh, the number of very hot days. So the number of days that the average Indian faces where it would be greater than 97, that's very, very hot, increases, uh, is projected to increase from about 4 to maybe 16. Uh, the number that is 94 to 96 probably increases from 7, or projected increase from 7 to maybe 17 or 18, and et cetera. And so you can see there's this very big piling up here. Now, why is that so important? Why is it not just enough to say that global mean temperatures went up by a couple degrees? The reason is all the bad stuff, uh, not all, most of the bad stuff comes in those really hot days. That's when uh, agriculture yields start to get squirrely. That's when uh, mortality uh, starts to get squirrely. And it, 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 indeed, India is facing a heat wave right now uh, that is causing high levels of mortality. So, what, but let's try and put some numbers around that. So this comes from some uh, research that I'm conducting with Robin Burgess, uh, Dave Donaldson, and Olivier Deschens. Uh, and it asks, well, what happens to agricultural yields historically uh, in India when you have uh, realization, uh, realizations of really hot days? And the exercise that uh, this is produced from thousands and thousands of data points and very rich statistical models, uh, but the exercise that this is reporting on is what happens if you take one day and swap it from the 70 to 72 category, that's this guy, and put it in any of these other categories. And the, what jumps out at you is that once you get above about 82 or 85, one extra day in one of those temperature ranges reduces annual agricultural yields by about half a percentage point. Okay, and so if you want to think, well, now you should be trying to do the math. Well, how many extra days did I see above 82 or 85? Well, that's what this is trying to tell you. So if you add up the difference between the blue and the red bars uh, above 80, uh, for say above 85, there's a whole mess of extra days uh, in, in that range. And each of those, what the data is trying to tell you, should be multiplied by a half a percentage point reduction in agricultural yields. So India is at risk of very substantial reductions. Uh, in agricultural yields. Now, you can do the same thing for mortality, uh, and let's just focus on the red line and ignore the blue line for the time being, uh, and run the same exercise. What happens if I swap a day from 70 to 72 uh, and put it in any of these other temperature ranges? Uh, and again, this is from the same work uh, with Rob and Dave and Olivier. And uh, there, it, it's at slightly higher temperatures that things start to go off the rails, but say at above 89, what you can see uh, is that an extra day uh, in that range relative to a day in the 70 to 72 range increases the annual mortality rate by about half a percentage point. Uh, and again, India is projected to get a lot more of those days. Uh, and so the cost of climate change, this is historical data, uh, uh, and you know, there, um, undoubtedly people will engage in some adaptations. Uh, but the cost of climate change for agricultural yields and mortality appear quite large. Uh, now, what's the blue line doing there? 
the blue line is from some other work uh, that I did in the United States conducting the same exercise. And the striking feature of that blue line is what? It's flat. There's no relationship to a first approximation between mortality and temperature in the United States. Uh, and so this is where the beginning of the talk, I think, start to converge uh, with the end of the, uh, with the, I think we're in fact six now. Uh, so if you're India, what do you want to do? Being Mr. Red is terrible. Uh, you don't have enough to eat. Uh, you have very high rates of mortality. What you would really like to be is Mr. Blue. Uh, and Mr. Blue, uh, the best way to get to be Mr. Blue is to use lots and lots of energy. Uh, and as we talked about uh, at the beginning, the least expensive sources, again, to produce, not the full cost, but to produce, are, are come from fossil fuels. Okay, uh, I, and then this is finally like a little newspaper piece that I wrote, uh, but is also meant to demonstrate, well, how much, uh, you know, what, what, what are we talking about with the scale of climate change? Uh, how much might be possible? Uh, and inside the world of uh, climate science, people talk about gigatons of CO2. Uh, most people don't know what a gigaton of CO2 is. I have a hard time uh, keeping it straight in my mind. So all I did is I converted gigatons of CO2 uh, into temperature change. Now that's something we can all relate to. Uh, and so what this says is what we've already done is we've baked into the system, this is our best estimate, uh, about a 1.7 degree Fahrenheit uh, increase in temperatures. So that's from the Industrial Revolution to now. But the question is how much more could we do? Uh, and I'm going to show you with a bunch of different categories here. So if you go to fossil fuel reserves, these are Coal, this is coal, oil, natural gas, things we can get at today with today's technologies and it would be economical to do it at today's uh, prices. That's <coughs> about another 2.8 degrees Fahrenheit laying there. Uh, the energy industry has a, you know, I've been, uh, we need to work on their understanding of economics. They don't really use what we like to call a supply curve. So the next category are, is resources. Uh, and this is just oil and gas resources, never mind coal for the moment. Uh, and these are things that we know we could get with today's technologies, but it would be too expensive at today's prices. So the higher prices we could get them. If we added those into the mix, you'd get about uh, an extra 3.1 degrees uh, Fahrenheit increase. Uh, and then finally, there's coal resources, which I haven't shown you yet. Uh, and I think I'll just, uh, I'll give away the punchline here. You, it's hard to walk around without stubbing your toe on some coal. Uh, and if we were to use all the coal resources, there's about 8.6 degrees uh, Fahrenheit increase. So this is maybe 16 degrees. And this has nothing to do with methane hydrates or other forms of fossil fuels that uh, guys in the oil and gas companies are feverishly working to figure out new ways to get at. Uh, and then in case this hasn't come all the way uh, across, I'll just drive it home here. Restraining climate change is going to be a global project uh, or, or has to be a global project. Uh, so the red is just what happens at the United. So the, the, the dotted line there is uh, what happens to atmospheric concentrations of greenhouse gases under a kind of business as usual scenario without any coordinated policy actions. Red would be if the United States adopted a pretty aggressive uh, uh, climate uh, greenhouse gas mitigation strategy, much more aggressive than is the, uh, the United States is currently on the path to doing. Uh, and you could see that you know that would have an effect. It would not have a terribly uh, large effect. And the reason is those what we saw in the beginning about the trends in energy consumption. Uh, and so one way to add all that up is you ask. Well, what's the cumulative share of greenhouse gas emissions by country? So here, I've, just for uh, conciseness, I've grouped China and India together. You can see as of today, or 2010, the United States accounts for about 22% uh, of all uh, greenhouse gas emissions uh, since the Industrial Revolution. China and India together only 16%, but that's changing, it's changing quickly. Uh, by 2050, uh, China and India would be about 30%, the US would be 16%, uh, and 2100, uh, China and India would be up to 37% uh, and the U.S. would be down to 12%. So there's, the only point is there's no path to restraining climate change that doesn't run through uh, China, India, and other uh, developing countries. I, I'm going to skip this in the interest of time. Okay, so 
The seventh and final fact, and then we'll start to turn into some policy uh, directions, is that energy is mispriced and is mispriced severely. Um, uh, so the first thing is uh, that a lot of people get it for free around the world, uh, and uh, that's because uh, there it is treated kind of as a, uh, let's call it a right rather than a private good. Uh, and uh, so, but that has a perverse effect. Uh, it is very, very difficult, maybe let's, I would say impossible, to run a for-profit enterprise or even a not-for-profit enterprise where what you take in is less than uh, what you put out. Uh, and that is the, the case in too many parts of the world. Uh, and so here's the trans, th these are electricity losses. Think of this as the amount of electricity uh, the distribution companies around the world are not paid for. And you can see that in the OECD countries, it's maybe five or six percent. That's just because there's some natural loss as you move electricity uh, across the wires. But in a lot of countries in the world, Pakistan is 17 percent, India it's more than 20 percent, Zambia it's almost 25 percent, uh, where that's not true. And the consequences uh, of, uh, of those large losses, this is not a, uh, uh, let's call this, this is not a from a randomized control trial, but it's a very suspicious looking graph. Uh, and on the x axis, what it says is that it, it reports uh, the, uh, trans the, the losses as a percent of the electricity put out, and then the uh, consumption per capita. And what you can see is it's very, very hard to have high levels of consumption unless you also have high repayment rates uh, or low loss rates. Uh, and a major problem, uh, I think, in a lot of developing countries is finding a way to break uh, the sense that electricity is a right, which effectively leads to these high losses, and getting it to be treated uh, like a private good. So, the, uh, so that's okay. The second thing is uh, a common way for redistribution, especially in developing countries, is uh, to subsidize the consumption of energy. Uh, and that means, I think uh, the famous statistic is like, you know, a gallon of gas in Venezuela is, I don't know, is 4 cents or 40 cents or something like that. But a r ridiculously low amount. Uh, and it, they're justified as a way to redistribute uh, to the poor. Uh, but the, these subsidies end up being very large. Uh, the red dots are as a percentage of GDP. Uh, and you can see that there's plenty of countries that are in the high single digits. Uh, Iran is a leader at maybe 15 percent, and uh, so this is form of redistribution that makes the consumption of energy uh, too cheap. And what I mean by too cheap is it people are always going to use it inefficiently and use too much of it. Um, and yet, despite doing that, it really does a very poor job of hitting, uh, targeting the poor. Uh, and so you can see here the fraction of that subsidy. In, for natural gas, in the case of natural gas, electricity, uh, and gasoline, that actually hit the bottom 20% of the income distribution. And it shouldn't be surprising, the poor don't consume a lot of anything. Uh, and uh, so here they're not really a, a, a large beneficiary of these subsidy policies. Uh, and then the third point is that uh, how energy is mispriced is that uh, it really favors fossil fuels. Uh, and uh, let's just return uh, to this graph here. So the fact that energy prices is the cost of producing a kilowatt hour of electricity, it does not reflect those health costs we looked at from China or from air pollution. It does not reflect the uh, monetized value of the climate damages uh, that fossil fuels use. But if you were to embed those in the prices, which uh, I'm sure they teach you even here at the LSE is a good idea, uh, you would have a very different picture. Uh, and suddenly the coal plants that look like a great deal no longer look so good. Uh, and so the medium blue, this is the uh, health cost from air pollution, and the light blue is uh, the monetized value of carbon damages. And we can uh, have healthy debates, I'm sure, about the proper value of each of those numbers, but it changes the playing field. And if we had a world where the full cost of energy, that is uh, its cost of producing it along with its health and climate uh, effects were also embedded in it, we would have a, uh, you know, we, we might be making very different energy choices. That's what uh, jumps off of it. Okay, so what are the policy implications uh, of those seven facts? Uh, so let's return to our guy here. What would he like us to do? 
so the first thing is uh, that uh, it, there's a virtuous circle between repayment rates, energy supply, and growth, uh, and finding a way to break this treatment of uh, energy as a uh, right, I think it would have a lot of value, uh, potentially very large benefits to increasing repayment rates. Uh, the second is that these energy subsidies that exist in many parts of the world uh, are very expensive uh, and exacerbate uh, inequality as well as leading to excess consumption uh, of energy. Uh, and I think that the world is, with technological advances like the ID cards that, uh, that are linked to bank accounts that now exist in India, there's uh, opportunity to replace these subsidies uh, with direct redis redistribution so you could retain the redistribution to the poor without having the negative impacts on, on the environment. Uh, and then uh, finally, uh, you know, the pricing energy based on the full social cost uh, uh, will reduce uh, health and climate damage. And that, there's a real opportunity to make progress on that. Uh, now, what I want to highlight, though, is that at some level, these are all super high-level recommendations. Uh, I, I like to joke that the IMF surely earlier today put out a report saying most of this and probably will put out another report tomorrow saying the same thing. Uh, and that hasn't made a huge amount of progress uh, in changing the world. And I think that's where it opens up uh, real opportunities for the kind of research uh, that is being done at the IGC and some other places uh, is to really find ways uh, to identify practical policy solutions, not just solutions that exist at 10,000 feet. Uh, and so I, let me give you one example on it. I, again, I, uh, you'll have to excuse that I'm drawing from my own research, which of course is the research I know best. Uh, and here's an example of a uh, policy in India that needed some, uh, was not working very well, uh, that was aimed to uh, prevent the air pollution that causes, huge, uh, causes the health problems we spoke about. Uh, and so this was done in the state of Gujarat. This is uh, the state where Modi's from. This is actually a picture of some of the factories who are part of our, uh, the study that I'm about to explain. Uh, Gujarat is the most industrialized state in India and also among its most polluted. Uh, and the Gujarat Pollution Control Board has as one of its responsibilities to enforce uh, Indian environmental law. And that involves uh, uh, in, uh, enforcing the laws on the roughly 20,000 industrial plants. Uh, and a private, so just start, the, the setting is that India has a very strict environmental laws on the books yet the status quo is these high levels uh, of pollution. Uh, Gujarat uses a third party audit, audit system to enforce environmental regulations. So what's a third party audit system? That means uh, they want to figure out who's polluting too much so they can penalize them. Uh, so there's a requirement that every year every plant has to hire an environmental consulting company to come in, take measurements three times a year, report those measurements to the uh, regulator, and then based on those results, the plant could be uh, fined if it was found to be an exceedance. Uh, now, the problem with this is uh, that the polluters select and pay their auditors. So there's a very natural question of what auditor could remain in business for very long uh, if they were able, if they reported that uh, the plant was violating the law. Uh, and indeed, uh, the Gujarat Pollution Control Board came to us and said, and said, we're very concerned that a third party audit program with these high levels of pollution, but everyone seems to be reported to be in compliance. Uh, and so what we did is we designed an intervention uh, that aimed to break this conflict of interest that was, uh, between, uh, that was preventing the auditors from telling the truth. Uh, and so how did we do that? We, did, we, we changed the status quo system in three ways. One, you were no longer allowed to, the plants were no longer allowed to pick their own auditor. Uh, two, they were no longer allowed to directly pay the auditor. They had to pay to a central pool. The central pool then paid the auditor, so there was no, at least legal, uh, exchange of uh, currency or resources between the plant and the auditor. Uh, and then the third is uh, to incentivize further incentive for the auditors, we did some back checking uh, of the auditors, and we went and took the same readings they did a few days after the auditors had been there. And if we got similar readings, we gave them a cash bonus. Okay, so what does this look like in practice? Uh, 
so there's a little formatting issue. The red line should actually be a little bit further over. But the, uh, the amazing thing is that in the status quo, just as the regulator suspected, all the plants are reported uh, as being in compliance. To first, 94% of them are reported as being in compliance. And not just in compliance, but just below uh, the, the, the red line. Now, uh, so we wondered, well, is that really the truth? So we did our, the back checks. Uh, and what you can see is that the distribution of pollution, uh, the particulate matter emissions, that is the truth, so that is what our back checkers found, is very different than what the auditors reported. Uh, and indeed, 60% uh, of the plants actually have pollution levels that exceed the standard. I, my personal favorite part of this graph is that there's a bunch of guys with very, very low levels of pollution, but even they, uh, the auditor was scared to report anyone being so low, even they uh, were reported in this kind of uh, range right below. So the system was not working very well, I think it's safe to say. Uh, so the second, so then the question is, well, we tried to break the conflict of interest. Were we successful at that? Uh, and here's the first picture into that, and I think it's, uh, it, it looks promising, although I will have to show you the back checks as well. But right away, we see the distribution of pollution in the treatment group. So these plants were randomly assigned into the status quo versus treatment. Looks much more dispersed. There's plenty of guys being reported as above. Uh, and indeed, when you layer over that the distribution for the back checks, uh, you can see that it's not a perfect match, uh, but they're much more similar. And so it appears that the treatment freed the auditors from the tyranny of having to appease uh, the plants uh, and got them to start reporting the truth. Now, that's fun and that's neat and important that economic incentives can work. Uh, but the goal, after all, was to alter the amount of air pollution that people were breathing, the water pollution. Uh, and so we then went and looked at, well, what happened to the plant's pollution concentrations? And the most important finding from this study is that the reform auditing program uh, caused plants to reduce their pollution emissions uh, by 28%. And so I just want to turn back to this in, you know, in, in the frame of the overall talk. It's one thing for the IMF to put out that report, uh, which effectively says we should have effective environmental regulations. Uh, and it's another thing to actually figure out how to do that where you understand the, the local institutions and the incentives uh, that people face. And that's uh, something that the IGC and JPAL and a lot of, uh, uh, and a small set of other people have been uh, engaged in. And here, this is meant to be an example of what, what's feasible. Now, I also want to emphasize that change did not come to the world very easily. Uh, this was all well and fine, and we showed this. We published it in the Quarterly Journal of Economics. I'm sure uh, most people in this room would not be willingly caught reading that, uh, unless there's a very, very severe case of insomnia. Uh, and so what we also wanted to do was to make sure that this had an influence on the real world. And so to do that, we engaged in a pretty aggressive media outreach program to disseminate the findings. And the aim of that was to create some space for the regulator who we had cooperated with throughout uh, to make these changes. And so th this received a lot of attention in The Economist and The Wall Street Journal and uh, lots of Indian publications. Uh, and the result of that is in January 2015, this year, uh, the Gujarat Pollution Control Board instituted the reforms that we showed could be effective in Gujarat. Uh, and not just that, I think it illustrates uh, that there are lots of opportunities from this kind of micro work uh, to find solutions. And in particular, upon uh, the results from the study becoming known, a series of other ministries uh, in India have be, uh, contacted us, the Central Pollution Control Board, the Maharashtra Pollution Control Board. Uh, we've also begun work in Bihar with the electricity distribution companies there. Uh, and I, I think there is a hunger so part of the problem is that no one really knows how to go from the high level uh, recommendation to a policy on the ground. And so there's a hunger, I believe, for trying to uh, find that. And uh, so, and you know, here's a nice quote from Hardik Shaw, who was a kind of visionary uh, member secretary that is uh, basically the effective CEO of the Gujarat Pollution Control Board showing, you know, saying that this partnership and the research combined, which we've done hand in hand with the Gujarat Pollution Control Board, allowed for discovering a solution to a problem uh, that they had. Okay, so let me just touch upon some areas where this, these approaches could be applied, uh, and then I'd be happy to get uh, 
some commentary from the audience and, of course, uh, from Nick Stern. So uh, the, I think critical research areas include how do you increase, can you break the social norm of treating energy uh, uh, as a right and turn it into a private good? Uh, how do you uh, electrify or bring access to energy to people who are, uh, you know, in rural areas and that may, maybe can be served by the grid but maybe cannot be served by the grid in a cost-effective way? Uh, how can you identify efficient energy efficiency policies? Uh, and how do you identify policies uh, to limit the climate and pollution damages uh, from energy consumption? Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Michael. So we're now going to turn to uh, Nick Stern, who's going to offer a few comments, and then we'll open it up to the floor. In the spirit of informal discussion, let's do we just sit here and talk to each other. Yeah. And, okay. Thanks very much, Mike. That was a very uh, rich and thoughtful um, presentation, and the research on which it's based is uh, very strong and, uh, and very broad, as, as you saw. So my comments are really about how things might go from here and uh, why in some ways I would make the statements even more strongly uh, than you made about, about policy. Um, so let me divide comments into sort of three classes and then um, just apply some of those very quickly to one or two of the facts. I won't go through the whole lot because we want time for uh, discussion. The first is that when you look at the relationships, um, there are very strong reasons to think that um, looking forward will look very different from looking back. Um, partly that's because people may well follow the kinds of policies that you and I would advocate, but also because I think the uh, the structure of the relationships could be changing very profoundly, partly with the structure of the world economy and partly with uh, technological change. Um, this is an extraordinary moment in world history where uh, in the next 30 some years we'll move from three and a half billion people in cities to six and a half billion people in cities. Uh, it won't be very far away from that, we're 50 percent of uh, seven billion now and that will be 70% of nine point something billion in the middle of the century. So it is bound to be something like uh, a move from three and a half billion to six and a half billion. That immediately says that uh, all our forecasts of energy are gonna be profoundly influenced by, ha by how, how that happens. Um, and this kind of thing happens only once in human history where right? you charge from 50% to 70% in such a short uh, period of, of time. And at the same time, technical progress, I think, is faster than we have ever seen. Uh, you've got three huge waves of technological change going on at the same time, all of which are probably in the early stages, uh, digital materials and, uh, and bio. Um, if you talk to the digital people, they claim very strongly that we're, in their terms, only in the horse and buggy stage that there's so much more to come. So if you put together the profound structural transformation, urbanization, plus of course the movement of output, division of labor towards the developing world, and secondly those periods of technological change, then um, it means that uh, how we think about these relationships is going to have to be uh, affected by those kinds of um, phenomena. Um, they'll be affected by policy too, but it's policy that set in that kind of structural change. And I think it makes a big difference uh, how we think about uh, what might happen. On the you know, moving from structural change to the policies themselves, I think that we as economists and in general have systematically understated the uh, externalities and the problems. Um, and it's starting to emerge much more strongly now um, for a combination of reasons. Just take the air pollution. We're getting much better imagery on PM 2.5, PM 10 from satellites 
Um, we're accustomed to seeing pictures of Beijing and I lived in Beijing in 88 and have been going there once or twice a year for the last 25 years. Um, the pollution you can see and the pollution that you breathe are different things. The PM 2.5 you don't see, but it's the most damaging. Um, it's the tiny stuff that your nostrils and your tonsils don't filter out and it gets straight into your lungs and it's like chain smoking all day and uh, all night. And what we've seen now with satellite observations, the PM 2.5 is not just in the cities, it's across the whole east coast of China. Uh, and we're seeing now with epidemiological studies and direct uh, looking at the functioning of the medical clinical effects, that just how damaging that is. And um, there's one paper by Kirk Hamilton that I've used in some of our work over the last couple of years or so, which suggests that um, with some fairly standard uh, costs of life, that's all very crude, but um, fairly standard costs of life, the damage just from the PM 2.5 mortality, of course there's much more pollution than that, uh, in China is over 10% of China's GDP. Um, this is immense. Um, if you look at the UK, the UK Supreme Court accepted about three weeks ago that the, uh, uh, this was a Health Protection Agency study, um, that 30,000 people die a year, or 29,000 people die a year in the UK from air pollution. And um, 1,700 die from road accidents. So that's well over 15 times the road accidents. If you took a value of life in the UK at uh, a couple of million pounds, typically they tend to come out about 100 times uh, GDP per capita when you look at these numbers. Well, if you multiplied um, two million pounds by 30,000, that's 60 billion, which is uh, pushing 4% of the UK's GDP. And the U UK is quite dirty, but it's not nearly as dirty as a lot of other, other places. Uh, Germany worse, probably. Um, more diesel, more burning of uh, lignite, and so on. It's very important to get a feel I haven't mentioned climate change yet. That's the, it's very important to get a feel of just how big these things are. Recent IMF study about two week, about a couple of weeks ago now by Dave Cody and Parry and others estimated energy subsidies um, at $5.3 trillion per annum around the world. That's about 6.5% of world GDP. Roughly half of the IMF estimate was air pollution, roughly a quarter was climate, uh, climate change and I think they used a, a price of CO2 which was too low to look at climate change but even using those numbers you get 5.3 trillion dollars a year at 6.5 percent of GDP you know primary energy in world GDP is probably about five percent or so or less so just comparing those two you know the, uh, the, the, sub, the subsidies from unpriced externalities largely uh, more than double on average, more than double on average the cost of energy. So it's very important to be clear on the magnitude of these things. They are immense. Now of course <coughs> coal is the worst and the uh, price of a tonne of coal is about $50. Uh, if you add on a pretty modest carbon price, um, just take $25 a, a tonne of CO2, there's about 1.9 tonnes of CO2 in a tonne of coal, so you're taking that 50 close to 100. And uh, Mike's argued for a climate, for a carbon price well above $25, and I've argued for a carbon price well above the uh, carbon price that Mike, Mike has argued for. So I was very modest in, uh, in that. And then on top of that, of course, you've got the air pollution, which is much bigger than the climate change. The, the coal is probably at least $200 a tonne. Yeah. And uh, so whenever somebody begins a sentence, coal is cheap, you shouldn't let them finish the sentence um, because it's not cheap, it's very expensive. Now, Mike built that up. Uh, he said it's cheap to get out of the ground, and he was right, but then you have to add on. But I wanted to emphasize just how big these things are. They're enormous. So the question then 
you know, so that's an example of my second op observation that uh, uh, I agree with what Mike said on my, most of the policy story in the calculations, but I would make it uh, bigger. And that leads to the last part of what I want to say. It's so much, it's so rich, there's lots of other bits and I can't go into them. But the Mike at the end had a very interesting series of observations about how policy comes about. Um, and I just wanted to add to them. I think the example that Mike gave is a very telling one, a very important one. Um, you don't just uh, do good research, you <laughs> explain to people what you've done and why it matters and how it can be used. And that last part, which Mike and others have done so well, is, is quite rare. Um, but there are other ways. Um, one is the courts. And it's very interesting how they see this as, in large measure, human rights issues rather than uh, costs and benefit and sticks and carrot issues, which we think of as economists. Costs and benefits are our stock in trade, and you know there's regulations and prices and all that. But um, we, let me just give you two examples of, of a human rights kind of story. One is the move from um, diesel to compress natural gas for auto rickshaws, auto rickshaws and buses in Delhi. This was not regulation. This was by, by government agencies. This was not government policy that was passed in parliaments. This was um, a court decision that uh, people in, crudely put, people in Delhi had a right to breathe. And it uh, changed very quickly from your black and white diesel auto rickshaw to your sort of black and yellow uh, diesel auto rickshaw to your um, green and yellow compressed natural, natural gas auto rickshaw. So the courts can have an effect and that, that Supreme Court ruling in the UK uh, that the UK ought, it was obligated to uh, move much faster on cutting air pollution than it was doing in order to comply with um, EU legislation was in part motivated around uh, human rights issues, but of course in part um, uh, motivated by the uh, structure of European law and their view of what that meant for UK courts. A, sec a second route um, is social pressure. Um, environment in China became um, uh, an, uh, an intense political social issue. I mean, one very recent, uh, that's been building over quite a period of time. Top politicians themselves in private will say, what's the point of all this apparent increase in GDP if our cities are un unlivable? So it becomes political. There was a wonderful movie which um, many of you may have seen, or at least parts of it, by a Chinese uh, TV journalist describing the way in which um, uh, pollution had started to affect people's lives, including her own life and her own child. And those kinds of things can start to build. And pollution in China is very political. And I think pollution in India is becoming political. I flew from Delhi, I flew from Beijing to Delhi in March, and the PM 2.5 count in uh, Beijing, if I recall, was about 100, and in Delhi it was 250. At 250, that, at 250, you close the schools in Beijing, and that's how far behind 13 of the 20 most polluted cities in the world are in India. So I think, I, I mentioned the courts route, and I think the uh, social pressure story will start to build as well. So one of the duties, I think, of of, of people who measure and people who try to think through the consequences of measure, measuring is to get the information out there and turn it into something political. In China, it, the announcement each day, and you know, any, if you've got an app on your phone, you know, you, you, and you're walking around in Beijing, you just look up what are the uh, numbers today, and getting the numbers out there makes a big difference, but of course at the same time, you have to uh, get people to um, understand what the consequences of these numbers in terms of shortening of your life would be. Uh, they calculated when President Obama went to uh, Delhi um, in the uh, earlier part of this year, I think he was there for three days and they calculated it had shortened his life by six hours. So these are the kinds of um, communication 
of consequences that I have no idea whether it was accurate or not, but it's the kind of thing that strikes people that gets you. We have to find ways which are honest with the facts, but express them in ways that uh, get political traction. So those are, are my thoughts. Think about fundamental structural change in thinking about how some of these relationships and technical progress. Secondly, I would um, ratchet up quite substantially some of uh, Mike's policy conclusions. And last, I think, that whole area of how you translate understanding into uh, action is enormously important. And I thought all the parts of Mike's talk were telling, and it was very good that he closed on that one. So thanks very much. So that was a very rich set of comments. So what I suggest we do is that Michael will respond for a couple of minutes, and then we'll open it to the floor. So those, I appreciate the uh, careful attention to the talk I put together. Uh, as always, happy to have uh, your reactions and uh, enjoy them. I, you know, I'm anxious to hear what everyone here has to say. <clears throat> let, let me just uh, say yes, the two quick reactions. Uh, there is a danger in looking backwards to figure out what's coming, uh, and the world is changing quickly, and uh, I think Nick is right. We don't know in what direction and what way. I, I tried to surface one of my fears that uh, the technical change was happening in fossil fuels faster than it was in renewables. I don't know if that's right. Uh, but I think that's something important to keep an eye on. Uh, and then I, 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 I take uh, his gentle words uh, as kind of a message to all academics in some respects, which is I think we're very good at building up our own worlds and our own forms of communication that are very effective uh, at you know, judging people and uh, figuring out uh, who's good and who's up and who's down. Uh, but in doing all of that, I think what can be lost, and I, I think this was a gentle message, is that uh, we can lose the ability to communicate with the rest of the world. Uh, and when that happens, a lot of the gems and the uh, ideas and the powerful evidence that does get produced inside universities uh, is unable to influence the real world. And that's, that's certainly something that I, I, I'm very focused on uh, trying to get better at. And, I know uh, also trying to influence other people to become better at it. And it's certainly something that the IGC has put a lot of attention on, and I think it's an important cause. Thanks. Uh, can I just say one thing on fossil fuels and uh, renewables? Um, fossil fuels have seen technical progress, but they still have um, something which goes the other way, which is David Ricardo and David Ricardo, yeah, and uh, essentially um, their, any technical progress will be imposed on an increasing marginal cost associated with extraction. And uh, so you've got two offsetting forces and there'll be periods when one's a bit faster than the other. Uh, I think the last few years technical progress has been a bit faster, but there's a fundamental Ricardian theory of extraction with rising marginal cost there, that won't go away. Uh, the second is the volatility of fossil fuels. Um, there's no volatility in the price of sunshine, and there is volatility in the price of fossil fuels for all kinds of geopolitical reasons. So in comparing, I usually think that uh, fossil fuels have got a no trend that I could, in, no trend in price that I could confidently stick with, you know, I don't know over 15 or 20 or 30 years whether the Ricardian rising marginal cost of extraction effect will, how far that will be offset by technical progress. And if you look at it over the long period of time, you know, if anything, it, the trend is, has been upwards, but who knows, it could be. Uh, it, it, but I think the best thing is to say fossil fuels long run flat with lots of oscillation and renewables long run going down with not much oscillation. So that's the way I, I think of these things, and that the, um, the uh, renewables will win, but they'll win a lot more quickly if we are sensible about uh, policy and pricing for pollution and carbon. Okay, so why don't we gather some questions. So if you could just raise your hand. 
Okay, there's a lady down in the front that just perhaps just say who you are briefly and what your question is. And we'll take in groups of three. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for the presentation. It started off, I was wholly depressed in your first uh, sort of half, of half an hour of the presentation and you sort of wore me around towards the end. So I don't know if that was intentional, but uh, it, was, it was fascinating. Um, you made a point about um, shale in relation to, you know, people don't leave $100 on the ground, un underground. And uh, obviously if there's $100, $100 on the table, you don't leave it there, unless maybe there's a tax of $70 of picking it up. And you didn't mention anything about carbon taxes. I, I wonder why that was. And secondly, um, your figure about um, kilowatt hours per consumption and um, transmission losses, the interpretation that, you, that, that, that um, markets don't exist because there are so many transmission losses, I thought was not the only interpretation of that statistic you could come to. There's obviously a high uh, incentive to steal when you're, when you're very poor, and that seemed like a, a more natural interpretation of those figures, and I, I wonder in your first two points, critical research areas, you focus very much on um, big utility solutions to energy. And, and in your report, there's not much about the democratization of energy and, um, and residents and, and businesses becoming energy asset owners. I wonder why those parts, why you left out carbon taxes and why you left out you know, distributive scale solutions. Okay, so the gentleman here next to the projector, you can sorry you bring the mic. The, the coming. No, th thanks also it's a very, very clear and thoughtful presentation which I, I found uh, very great interest uh, I want to pick up just on one point uh, well, the, in fact this last point discussed about the contrast between fossil fuels and renewable is where nuclear comes in all this uh, because it, I noticed your charts it uh, uh, nuclear had no external costs, which I, I was absolutely amazed about because uh, you see, it could be so sort of many tens of thousands of years, if not hundreds of thousands of years, before the waste from nuclear can be dealt with. And uh, I thought that was a rather big externality. Okay, there was a question up the back, the lady raising her hands. Thank you for the presentation. Um, you were speaking about energy access. Now, the, currently, the ener a lot of the energy used by people with limited energy access is traditional biomass use. And in your research areas, you mentioned rural electrification. So I'm wondering whether you see uh, electrification as also being something that will come, uh, that will replace traditional biomass use. OK, so why don't you sure. fight that off? So on the carbon taxes, no, that was actually in the center of the whole thing. Uh, so at the end, I show what happens uh, uh, to the cost of producing uh, a kilowatt hour from different sources, and I show that uh, the climate damages. The idea of that is that that tells you the magnitude of the carbon tax you'd like to have. Uh, so that, that uh, to, to reflect those damages. Uh, you also asked about, oh, the democratization of energy. Yeah, so uh, let me be a little provocative about that. Uh, it's very popular in Germany and the U.S. and in developing countries as well to kind of have everyone have a solar panel, everyone have a, uh, a, a wind farm on the top of their house or something like that. And there are situations where I think that's economical, uh, but by and large, part of the reason that uh, we have relied on to date uh, grid-style uh, production or supply of electricity is because it's so darn cheap. Uh, and there's lots of efficiencies uh, when you do it all in, in one place and deliver it. So I think it's not to say that there aren't situations where that might uh, make economic sense, but by and large, I think uh, that it's a more expensive way to supply electricity. Uh, excellent point about where were the social costs of uh, nuclear waste. You might say, where are the social costs about nuclear disasters? We have one of those every once in a while. Uh, and so first of all, I don't know how to, ca so I'll just plead guilty. Actually, Nick and I had a very interesting conversation a couple of weeks ago about the, uh, fail the a failing of economists only look where the light is shining. Uh, and I don't know how to value that nuclear waste. So that's why it wasn't there. That doesn't imply uh, 
it's not a perfect graph, uh, so that was clearly missing. Nor do I know how to, I could probably make more progress on this, but have a great way on measuring the occasional damages uh, that happen from nuclear disasters. Uh, biomass uh, and electricity, yeah. So indoor air pollution is a uh, severe problem in many parts of the world. Uh, and one potential benefit of electrification would be to get people off of using uh, biomass and reduce the indoor air pollution that compromises uh, the well-being of the, primarily the women and children who breathe it in, the, the pollution from the burning of biomass. Okay, so let's have another round of questions. There was one more. Just raise your hand if you want to. Yeah. Hi there, my name is Kieran Sopforth. I work for Bloomberg New Energy Finance. Um, I found the chart, uh, well, thank you for, for a really interesting presentation and uh, discussion after. Um, I, I just wanted to draw attention to a couple of places where the reduction in technology costs of renewables are creating their own market. So, um, where um, we, we saw the chart of the direct comparison between fossil and renewables, but actually in places where you have a high grid electricity price, um, in places like California, um, then renewables have got to a stage where it is cheaper to install solar on your roof than it is to buy uh, electricity off the grid. And in that case, you know, you, uh, renewables have kind of, have kind of won in that situation, as it were. Um, another point is whilst you certainly, you couldn't, we're not at a stage where you could power the whole grid with renewable energy, but you could certainly, you can certainly uh, power an awful lot with it. And I think just uh, the third point is just to draw attention to the potential in off-grid rural applications, uh, particularly for solar. Um, so companies such as M. Copa um, and uh, Azuri is another one, uh, B-Box is another one. Uh, these companies are coming in um, to places where there are high costs of kerosene for lighting or high costs of grid electricity. And they've come up with solutions where, the, where installing a solar home system is actually lower cost than grid mm -hmm. electricity or kerosene alternatives. Um, so I, I don't know if you have any, any okay. comments. So, so uh, any other questions from the floor? Yeah, I'll start the gentleman here. Just next to the bank. Thanks, Mike. This is Amir. I'm a research fellow at Coventry University. Just a quick one on uh, nuclear, because it's, the document is quite silent on nuclear. So, so if it, we think like a country like India, so and Pakistan as well. Which, potentially have the nuclear resources as well. So do you see any future uh, for, for instance, in the plants may be in India and there could be a trans-country uh, grid which can supply to Bangladesh, Nepal, and Pakistan as well. And the reason is that partly that Pakistan might be going ahead with some plants, but they are on the I mean, low quality Chinese technology. So if there is more sort of competition than if it maybe US is supplying plants to India or technology, then do you see any future for nuclear? Because documents is totally silent. In okay. That. okay, there's one more question at the back. Yeah. Hi, my name is Hema Agrawal. Just a simple question, sir. We've talked about the various technologies of alternative energies. Which, uh, uh, which of these alternative energies do you think, like 25, 30, 40 years, could be the most dominant one, or uh, most successful one, which we would see? Can I, can I just yeah. use my, uh, yeah. so, so what, I, what I wondered was, you know, we both have young children, so if, if, if shale oil runs out after 10 years, or get an extra 10 years, what, it's very similar to your question, what, what happens after that? So for our kids, 10 years is not very long, <laughs> I'll be teenagers or something. Uh, so what happens when we, you know, so we get some free, free oil, some free gas, so what happens, what do you think is going to be the most promising uh, technologies that might, might take over from fossil fuels once we run out of everything. Yeah. Okay, so let me try and go uh, in order. So uh, 
I think the, yes, the high grid prices in California have generated opportunities for solar, there's no question. Now, I think uh, it would be wrong to assume that those high grid prices fell out of the sky. Uh, they reflect policy that directs, uh, that, that, that leads to higher prices uh, in, with an in, obvious intention of increasing uh, access to renewables. So, uh, you know, uh, that's policy driven. It's not technology driven. I think that's what I'm trying to say. It's been facilitated by the improvements in technology, but they would not, they are not competitive uh, on a completely even playing field, even in sunny California. Uh, I think you, you had a question about, I, I think, intermittency. I didn't completely understand it. Um, so maybe I'll, I'll just skip to your third question. Off-grid solar, for sure. There's going to be opportunities uh, in some locations where off-grid solar makes sense. Um, I think the amount of energy consumption that is really needed to bring people into much higher uh, standards of living uh, is difficult to ob obtain from uh, kind of small scale off grid solar. Uh, I think, you know, in the end of the day, it's often cheaper to get people on the grid for high levels of energy consumption. It's uh, hard to run businesses uh, off of the amount of energy that can be produced from solar panels. Uh, it can help run, you know, charge cell phones and do more than that, but I think. Uh, the reliability, the lack of intermittency, I think all, is always going to be tough uh, for renewables in, uh, in these remote settings where they can't be balanced uh, with other uh, sources of energy. There was a question here uh, about nuclear. Does nuclear have a, a future? And I, I was pretty quiet on nuclear. Um, so let me say, state this clearly. In a world without the proper pricing uh, of the health impacts of air pollution and without the proper pricing uh, of climate damages, the challenge for nuclear is that it's way out of the money. Uh, and so if we had a world that adequately priced those things and reflected the benefits of, that nuclear provides in terms of not producing air pollution and not uh, causing uh, greenhouse gas emissions, uh, then then nuclear would be competitive, but we don't have that world. And right now, it's uh, it's very hard to uh, see. That there's not a clear shot for nuclear. Uh, you know, one thing that I'll note, which is a kind of strange, I find it's a strange thing, is uh, the, there's a policy that's popular in states in the United States or something called renewable portfolio standards that mandate a certain fraction of the electricity supply come uh, from renewable sources. Uh, now, every state has a slightly different definition of that. Some like coal, some uh, like geothermal, I mean, sorry, none like coal. Uh, some like wind, some like solar, uh, some like geothermal, some like, a few like hydro. None of them have nuclear, as far as I'm aware. Uh, and so if you really view that as a uh, zero carbon energy source, which it is, at least after the construction of the plant, uh, that should, is something that should be favored as well, but it's not. So I think the fact that you do not have prices reflecting their full social cost really hinders uh, nuclear and will make it difficult for nuclear to play a major role in the growth of uh, energy supply in the coming years. Um, all right, so I am totally, totally, uh, since Nick already made the unfortunate move of staking out uh, more ability to see into the future than I can, I'm going to punt this last question to him uh, about which renewable he believes is going to be uh, do, uh, you know, most competitive in the marketplace in 25 to 40 years. And, but before I do, I just want to frame his answer by uh, a partial response to Robin. It's not that we only have 10 years left of uh, petroleum. It's that we got 10 new years of petroleum uh, from the shale. And you know, it's also been true. Uh, this is intended to be a little provocative, but it's, I don't think it's necessarily wrong. Uh, I don't think we're ever going to run out of, uh, uh, sorry, let me say it very carefully. Uh, it, uh, if you wanted to make the case that we're never going to run out of fossil fuels, uh, the backwards looking data are very supportive of that. Uh, because uh, if you take what was known in 1980 as usable, we would have been blown through that, I think, by 1990 or 1995. And I just think the ingenuity uh, 
of the guys at Exxon, the ingenuity of the guys at Schlumberger, the, the ingenuity of our green friends at Stat Oil uh, cannot be counted out. So now, Nick, you get to look yeah. into the future. Okay, thanks, thanks, Mike. <clears throat> I agree with what you just said about fossil fuels. If if you the question of them running out is not really relevant. That if you just take the known reserves, and I'm going to express what you put in your very last uh, few slides um, where you built up the temperature increase. I'll just express it in a different way. Uh, you can't burn um, more than a third or a maximum a half of the existing known proven reserves and still stay in the two degree centigrade uh, constraint. You just multiply the amount of emissions we've got left, cumulative emissions we've got left, maybe um, a thousand uh, gigatons of uh, CO2 equivalent, and you work out how much CO2 is in the known reserves, it's about three times that. Um, so that's the notion of unburnable carbon, which the Grantham get Carbon Tracker and Grantham Institute we've, uh, we've developed over the last few years. So it, it's not really an interesting question about when we run out because uh, this, we've got so much already that we can't burn from the point of view of uh, any kind of climate uh, story. The second thing on the, which technologies, I, I, get, I will make a punt, but I'll say something before I make a punt, is that it's very important that we investigate and try out all sorts of things. You shouldn't bank on any one punt. Um, I think China will probably build in the next 15 years or so uh, 100 or more um, one gigawatt nuclear plants. We're going to find out how cheap nuclear can be on scale. People bend your ears all the time and say, Nick, the answer lies in the thorium nuclear plants. I don't know. Um, it's a bit like that bit in The Graduate where the guy whispers plastics in Benjamin's ear. You probably all know that movie. Yeah. Um, the, but what we should be doing is looking across everything because the problem is so severe, the amount of time that we've got is so little that uh, in investment in innovation in um, the different ways of generating, low carbon ways of generating energy must have a very high return. So we should be investing across the lot. Now, if, if you force me just to go for one, then how does it look now? I would go for solar. Um, the price of solar has absolutely crashed in the last 10 years. Solar PV panel has probably come down by a factor of 10 in the last 10 or 12 years. That's quite remarkable, and that's without much technical progress. It's still basically the same technology, um, but it's just learning by doing economies of scale, motivated in large measure by policy, it's been very successful. Uh, so I think there's a lot more coming there, and I think the price of solar has been come crashing down without big technological change. We know there's big technological change in the system. We know there's big technological change coming in uh, storage. So if I had to bet on one, I would bet on uh, solar with the qualification that you shouldn't just bet on one. Hey, can I just add, if I had to pick one, uh, n not that it would work, uh, but that it's a huge mistake not to be investing more in than we are currently, uh, and that's CCS. I agree, uh, I agree. Uh, you know, I think, you know, five years ago, six years ago, it looked like we were on the precipice of really learning about carbon capture and storage, and you probably followed it more closely than I have, but I don't understand the why, I just know the outcome, which is somehow we didn't make much progress in the last six no. years. And probably $50 a ton carbon price over a 20 or 30 year period, it would probably break even. It doesn't have that now, but it probably would. Okay, so can we all uh, thank Michael Greenstead and Nicholas Stone.